Okay, so um, for those of you uh, who don't know me, my name is Emily Nordman and I am a lecturer in the School of Psychology at the University of Glasgow and I am one of the uh, authors on our 10 Simple Rules paper that you will all come to hear about today. Um, I'm principally joined today by Jill Mackay, who is a lecturer in veterinary education at the Royal Dick Vet School at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and Jill and I are going to do a little bit of a double act. Uh, but we also are joined by two, I think, uh, of our other co-authors. So there's Dr. Chiara Holland, also from psychology at the University of Glasgow. And there's uh, Louise Robson, who is Director of Teaching Learning for Biomedical Sciences at the University of Sheffield. Um, and they're going to be uh, in the chat and then with us uh, for the discussion. Just to give you a quick overview of the talk, um, I'm going to hand over to Jill in a second and she's going to do a brief overview of our 10 simple rules and the rules that underlie the rules. It's all going to get a bit meta. Um, it is going to be a brief overview of each one of them. It's going to be the headlines of the headlines um, because obviously the, the paper is out there. Um, I'm then going to present the contingency plans, the draft in progress contingency plans for my own first year course. It's a very large first year psychology course and I've been making my own plans uh, for September. Um, and I think it's helpful to be able to see how the ideas we have put down in the paper actually translate concretely into our practice. And then finally, as soon as that's over, we're going to do an open Q&A discussion. We're going to try to get to that as quickly as possible, but neither of us are that concise. So we'll see how it goes. Um, OK, so the other thing to note is that I am going to be Jill's wonderful assistant because of broadband issues. Um, so we're going to do a next slide, please. And I will um, uh, put Jill uh, on. Anyway, yes. So over to Jill, who will uh, do the next part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Emily. And next slide, please. So first off, who are we? Why should you listen to us? I would call us discipline-based education researchers. We all come from our own separate disciplines and we are interested in education within those disciplines. We all have some form of distance learning experience and we cover a range of disciplines, mainly focusing on STEM, but with um, some philosophy, for example, within veterinary science, we talk a lot about ethics and history and things like that. And we cover uh, a range of universities, including uh, Sheffield in England. And I know that we've got a lot of universities uh, represented from all across the UK uh, in our chat, which is great. I think we can really share good practice as a sector. Next slide, please, Emily. So we've written this guidance on a temporary online pivot. We've put this up as a preprint. For those of you who are aware, we welcomed feedback. We spent, I think, three weeks collecting feedback from a real range of people, some fabulously useful feedback, addressed that feedback, and now this is uh, in consideration in the PLOS, just in case it doesn't get accepted and you can see all of the ways in which you know, the peer review process sometimes does not um, reward hard work. Next slide, Emily. We are, of course, talking about the impact of COVID-19. There is a huge amount of debate about what is going to happen with this disease. I am one of life's pessimists, so I personally expect that this is going to be around for a very long time. But we can certainly expect that we should need to deal with this until 2021 at the very earliest. We as educators, we as leaders within education need to expect that shielding is going to happen. We need to expect that vulnerable people are not going to be able to come onto campus. We need to expect all colleagues and students to need to take sick leave. We need to expect limited travel where there might be restrictions, certainly between countries, but possibly also between sect uh, regions in the UK. And we need to expect some form of social distancing, at least for some months to come, including with personal protective uh, equipment. That is not to say that everybody will get sick, but we need to expect that this will happen to at least some of our colleagues, friends, family, students in the next six months. And one of our challenges is how can we make sure that that risk does not disproportionately affect those who are more vulnerable. Next slide, please, Emily. 
So our rules. We are submitting to a series called 10 Simple Rules, hence why we called them rules. We actually would have preferred guidance or thoughts or principles. Um, they're really just things that we think we're considering when we are exploring how we are going to teach in our field that we thought would be useful for others to think about as well. Something that was extremely important to us, so I've done an awful lot of um, program design work and uh, worked a lot with colleagues who are less familiar with the theory behind of a lot of education work. We really wanted this to be accessible to people who are not really viewing themselves as educators, who maybe don't engage a huge amount with the professional development of education. I think this is a really important point to bear in mind for our discussions this afternoon because we are obviously people who are really interested in education hence while we're at the tile seminar and so I i'm sure everyone here will have experience of discussing education with colleagues who are not always as interested in exploring new pedagogies tools developing um, their own practice or reflecting on their own practice i'm not here to criticize that perspective uh, but I do think it's really important that as the leaders in education, we try to take um, a lot of, we try to take some of the responsibility for increasing provision across the sector. We can't leave behind those educators who don't view themselves as educators, who really just view themselves as researchers, for example, and uh, come in to do that odd lecture. They are still a really vital part of the student experience. We also think that these um, rules, guidance, guidelines, they are broadly applicable to further education. So I have quite a lot of further education experience from when I worked in the agricultural colleges uh, and also in schools, but I don't want to um, cast any uh, sort of false illusions here. Our expertise is really in higher education, particularly from our um, research perspective. And for us, the principle that we wanted to take through this whole thing is that COVID is going to have an impact on our equality, diversity and inclusion uh, ambitions for the sector. And we need to be really conscious of this as we move forward. Next slide, please, Emily. So our first rule is that a temporary online pivot is not the same as emergency remote teaching or a specialised online course. That is to say, what we're doing right now is a compromise. What we are probably going to do up until December, if not a little bit further, is a compromise that we have a little bit of time to do to work on. Um, we're not going to be able to design this as a brand new programme or even perhaps take some of the uh, key learning that we have from our online teaching, we may only be able to apply some of that to what we do. This is a compromise. It's not great, but this is the position we're in. Next slide, please, Emily. We think it's very important that you provide asynchronous content for students to access at their own time and when they are able to. This is partly because for example, today I have poor internet, so I'm sitting in the living room with my uh, broadband plugged into this laptop. My partner in the next room has had to go onto his phone's Wi-Fi for him to do his work today. This would not have been possible if uh, he had a busy day at work because he is the higher earner in this household and we have to prioritise his access over mine. And our students will be in the same situation we have to recognize that there are limitations to internet, there are limitations to access to device, there are limitations to access to free time in order to um, go to class, even if that class is online. So providing content asynchronously gives students a lot more freedom to plan their own days around what is difficult circumstances. Next slide, please, Emily. I see Julie's um, yeah, saying this is the first day she's been able to access decent connections since the beginning of lockdown. She has students in Kenya who don't have internet at home and are in different time zones. Absolutely. And if you've done any kind of international online teaching, I think this is going to be super familiar to you. But uh, banging my sort of agriculture drum here, do you know my students who have gone home to farms are sitting trying to access lectures on a 4G connection, which is spotty and sometimes at the top of a field. It's a real challenge. Rule three, 
provide synchronous and asynchronous contact and communication. So the interaction that we have, things like this, is such a key and important part of the learning process and the community process as well. We have to provide as many different opportunities for this as possible and try to ensure that those are accessed in a fair way. Next slide please Emily. Rule four is to set and communicate clear expectations about engagement. I think Emily did that brilliantly at the start of this session where she said among other things she didn't want people to be taking uh, sharing screenshots if it had somebody else's face in. Making sure that your students know what the rules are is the first step into helping them not fall afoul of those rules. If you want your student to address you as Dr Mackay, then you should tell them that they should address you as Dr Mackay. Um, next slide please Emily. Rule five, design appropriate assessments and communicate expectations clearly. This is kind of one of my favorite babies because I'm really interested in assessment, particularly from a veterinary perspective. How do we know we're assessing what we think we're assessing? And I think this is actually one of the real opportunities that this pandemic might give us to think about why do we assess in the way that we do and what actually is what learning is being assessed by this? Can we maybe think about this in more of an assessment for learning perspective? Particularly when you pair that with the synchronous and asynchronous contact points, thinking about how feedback is delivered to students and how students understand that feedback and integrate it into their practice, making it a truly dialogic process, uh, where it's a conversation between the expert and the, and the learner, could be something that actually is a real benefit to uh, having to think about how we deliver our programs. Next slide, please, Emily. Rule number six is monitor and support engagement. By monitoring engagement, there are many tools to do this. You can, many virtual learning environments will tell you what students have logged on and when, but even if you're just doing your synchronous or even your asynchronous uh, contact points, such as discussion boards or live sessions, try to have an idea of who is there, who's um, joining your sessions, who appears to be uh, dropping out. We know that not attending is a risk factor for later on having more issues with the program. And I want to really highlight, this is coming from my further education perspective, and uh, I'd be really interested in kind of bringing this up in the discussion as well. When we say support engagement, that has to be compassionate support. We have to recognize sometimes the limitations that um, this period is going to put onto people. This, isn't, this shouldn't be a case of you must attend absolutely everything or we're going to have some sort of disciplinary action unless that is really required perhaps for any sort of professional accreditation. But instead, what can we do to get you on these sessions? Is there some fund we can get you to access if you're not able to access a device? Is there something about the way we are scheduling this? Are you okay is the way we really want to be addressing this. Next slide, please, Emily. Rule number seven is review the use and format of recorded content. Now, this is a really interesting one. Some of you will be aware that Emily and I have uh, a lot of experience with recorded lectures, and we uh, spend a lot of time talking about how lecture recording is received by staff and students. And we know that we have quite a large library of materials. Some of that might be appropriate to share, but we should try be trying to create content for these students because there will be small things that aren't necessarily transferable, such as um, conversations in a in a recorded lecture, or you know, pointing to the um, the diagram on the screen instead of perhaps waving the mouse around so that students are able to see what is on the diagram and um, that is of use to them. Next slide, please, Emily. Rule number eight, focus on achievable learning outcomes for online field, laboratory and performance work. Working in veterinary science, this is something we are discussing a lot. How do we ensure that those practical skills still come out? There's a lot that video can do 
for this. There is a lot that we can perhaps uh, do with other interactive tools. For laboratories, lots of uh, concentrating on data handling skills, things like that could be a really good achievable learning outcome as opposed to the material or the outcomes which require students to be in a small fixed space in close proximity to one another, which is not going to be possible for some time. Next slide, please, Emily. Rule nine, ensure resources are available, accessible and signposted. In the paper, we uh, provide quite a lot of links in this section, particularly to a lot of JISC's online tools, which uh, support the way that students can access materials, making sure that students have, um, the students know how to use the library search function, that students understand that there are ways of them to access materials, but also you yourself looking at perhaps your course reading and thinking, do I really need to have this textbook sitting there. I'm actually partly because a lot of what I teach is research methods and many of you may be aware that research methods is quite a fast moving field particularly at the moment. Um, I often find that necessarily providing textbooks isn't always very helpful and I try to highlight key papers that are electronically available instead. Um, but if textbooks are really important for you, you need to start thinking and talking to your library resources right now about how students are going to be able to access them, how many students are going to be able to access that e-copy at any one time. And if, for example, you have a very large class with an assessment that makes, um, that relies very heavily on a particular uh, textbook, are you doing your part now to ensure that your library services are ready and prepared for that demand on the resource. Next slide please Emily. And our final rule, the one that we uh, think it kind of sums up everything that we're saying is that you have to create a community for the staff and for the students. It is important that everybody in this period feels as supported as they can be and that may not be hugely supported in some senses. Uh, I think as staff, we are all feeling a little bit under pressure here. We are working incredibly hard. There are some very upsetting um, uh, sort of headlines such as the universities may be closed for business when we've all never been working harder in our lives. Um, but we need to try and be compassionate to our learners, to each other, to our communities, and we need to try and integrate the good practice that we do have with what we, with our ambitions for the coming semester. So that was a really very quick rundown of the rules. I think in isolation we can sort of spend quite a lot of time talking about, you know, here is the reason why we have brought this particular rule into existence. But for me, one of the most useful things I find is hearing about practical experience. And so I'm going to now pass on to Emily, who's going to talk about how these rules are then implemented. And the only thing I'll say just before uh, Emily starts is that you can go and read the paper by all means. Uh, we are still accepting you know, comments and, and feedback on that is really useful. But when you are applying these rules to your own courses, to your own programs, to your own colleagues, thinking back to that being compassionate with one another, how can you be most effective in giving that information there? We've tried to produce some resources such as talks and things that support the dissemination of this material. But sometimes battering people over the head with a paper is not necessarily the most useful thing. And so I think recordings like this and even just saying to people, oh, you know, could you, we saw Emily and Jill do that talk at such and such, maybe they would come and do that talk somewhere else. And the conversation that arises from that, I think is sometimes the most useful practice. So I will now be quiet. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, so just before I show you my uh, contingency plans for my own course, these are the results of the, the questionnaire. This is the roughest text mining you could possibly do, um, but these are the kind of the, the most common words that came out. So I asked you what are your main concerns or practical challenges for pivoting online, and it is absolutely no surprise um, that engagement is number one by quite some distance. 
I know this terrifies people. It terrifies me as well. Um, I think it is the, by far the most difficult part of this. Workload also comes up a lot. Um, and then staff knowledge and skills. People are worried both for themselves and others that they just don't know how to you know, use the learning technology that's available. Um, and I've put the bottom one in italics because for reasons, maybe it's just that it's a different crowd. This one didn't come up in the comments for today, um, but it's come up in a previous version of this talk I've given, which is that the accessibility of materials. So what Jill was saying about um, you know, access to computers and internet and all that stuff. We need to make sure that we're uh, designing uh, for that. Um, the second thing I asked you was what aspects of online teaching and assessment do you already have experience with? And again, the results of this aren't particularly surprising. A lot of us, most of us have put our lecture content online, be that slides or recordings or additional resources and so on. Turnitin also featured there highly. Um, and things like uh, quizzes as well. Um, the more kind of um, online stuff, what am I trying to say? You'd like the uh, discussion boards and, and asynchronous activities lower down in that list. The reason that I asked you to, to do that was because I think what can be helpful to recognize is that we aren't starting from zero. I'm not saying this isn't going to be as scary as all hell. It is. But we're not starting from zero. And that it might be more helpful. And I've got to thank Simon Horrocks for this suggestion to the paper. But it's more helpful to, to describe what we're about to do as going from blended to online rather than offline to online. Because actually, we already do have quite a lot of things that we do online. Um, and I think the other story that this graph tells is really what, what Jill was saying is that if we're going to make it through the other side of this, then we really need pragmatic leadership that takes into account the team you have and the time you have. Um, you know, as, as Jill's already said, the person who has been refusing to record their lectures is coming along for this journey just as much as the person who's happy to burn it all down and start again. And this is why there's no one size fits all rule. You've got to go with what you've got. And sometimes that's not going to be perfect. It's going to be the best that you can do. And I think it's really important that any kind of leadership role, be that course leads like myself or, you know, directors of teaching or university senior management, really recognise that some of this is going to be the best we can do. And, and that's kind of okay. Okay, so um, my draft contingency plan, caveat, 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 caveat. Um, this is a draft contingency plan. This is not official policy from the University of Glasgow, from the Zoological Psychology, from any associated institution. I would please ask that if you want to discuss some examples that I bring up on social media, that's fine. Please do not put screenshots of this on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. I don't want my students seeing this and thinking that this is definitely what's going to happen. These are the kind of worst case scenarios you know, that we're, we're planning for, we haven't yet been told exactly what's going to happen with, for example, our labs. So um, the other thing I should say is I gave this talk two weeks ago. And in that time, this plan has completely changed. Um, so it, it might change again. So that's why I'm saying, please don't uh, share it. Um, just to give you a little bit of context about what the course was supposed to be like in September, first year psychology course with 500 students, there were three 50 minute lectures a week delivered twice a day because of room capacity. They got a two hour practical lab every two weeks. The first hour was on academic writing and uh, kind of supporting the essay assignment. The second hour was on data skills and learning programming in R. Typically there's about 50 students per lab, one lecturer uh, and two graduate teaching assistants of PhD students to support us. Uh, the assessment um, was an end of term closed book exam, had an essay and an MCQ component. Um, and that was um, what assessed the lecture content largely. There was then a coursework essay and then a continuous lab portfolio. So this was our homeworks, group presentations, some MCQs um, and uh, uh, research participation. Okay, so here is the contingency plan and 
I have to say as well that um, this isn't, this is not just from the head of Emily. This has been the entire team. We have spent, you know, weeks <laughs> mulling over the minutia and the detail um, of this. Uh, and um, yeah, it has been a, a real team effort. Um, and it's why it keeps changing because people keep coming up with, with new plans. And, you know, if you are doing this, you do need to make sure that you're speaking uh, to the whole team and that they're kind of coming uh, with you um, and, and, and giving ideas uh, as well. So in terms of the lectures, the current plan, again, the current draft contingency plan, um, is that we're going to pre-record the lectures and we're going to try and limit the amount of didactic content to 40 minutes max and split that into at least two videos, okay, so that the, the chunks are smaller. The recordings will be available for asynchronous engagement, but we're also going to timetable um, a watch party uh, at the, the regular lecture time via Zoom. So the lecturer will be there, the students will be there. You'll basically, it's like we're doing Netflix party, but for cognitive psychology or whatever it's gonna be. Um, during that watch party, the lecturer will pause the video or will use the breaks between the different as, uh, sections of the video to engage in active, so you know we're going to do polls, discussions, that kind of thing. Um, and then we're also going to ask the lecturers to engage in active discussions with students on Teams, and they're all going to have this shared OneNote for each lecture stream, so that they can like you know add in readings and stuff like that, and it's basically like a, a shared notebook. The rationale for doing it this way is that we want the workload of our the team to be focused on engagement with the students. It would take so much time for us to restructure and rewrite lectures to fit in to like a 15 minute, you know, single video each week, like you would do on an online course. And we think that it's a better use of time to put all of that effort into community rather than, you know, making this an online course because it's not an online course. Um, Pre-recording avoids any technological issues and staff anxiety. The thing that I'm really, really anxious about with my first years is, of course, that engagement and getting them, you know, building those relationships. So for me, the kind of the watch parties are very, very important because I want them all there in the same room at the same time. Um, I'm, we've talked about doing flipped classrooms for other levels. I don't think that's quite right for level one because, if, um, you know, actually most of the team agree that what you need is, is them there at the same time and you need to get them into that routine. If you do a flipped classroom, if they haven't watched the video, they might not then come to the synchronous bit. And for first year students, I, I want to basically, I want to spoon feed them a routine and a structure. Um, and then finally, the asynchronous engagement is for uh, flexibility. So if they can't make that time, the lecture content is still there and that's all good. Um, so I'm just, uh, Ros is saying, I'm personally really worried about equality. So if you schedule a live session like the watch party, but there are clear advantages to being there, but what about students who can't attend due to time zone internet con connectivity? Um, so, I mean, the watch party will be recorded. Um, I think, basically, if we don't schedule some, there has to be some synchronous events. And those events are going to disadvantage certain people. And what we've tried to do is limit the amount of synchronous events. But I think unless you made everything asynchronous, that's not really possible. And I also think that there is, I am all about inclusivity. I am all about um, making sure that there is the most flexibility baked in. But I also think that they have signed up for a full-time degree. They are full-time students and therefore there is a level. Okay. And my level is I'm going to strip away as much synchronicity as I can, but these are the bits that I think are crucial. So that's my answer to that, which, yeah. Okay, so the labs, um, the labs are, um, what we're going to, well, the draft plan is that to make most of the activities uh, largely asynchronous um, and have short 
you know, five, 10 minute pre-recorded uh, videos that would reflect the didactic bits of the lab. So in every lab, there'll be a bit where the lecturer stands up, explains something for a few minutes, and then the, you know, the, the active stuff begins. Those explanation bits will be in pre-recorded videos. For the programming side of things, uh, for the data skills, um, they're going to get kind of full on video walkthroughs. And that's um, partially because of the, the thing that it is. The students need a bit more support with R, uh, particularly in first year. So those videos are going to be quite extensive, but actually the length of the videos is potentially a, a good thing um, in, in terms of uh, supporting them. The synchronous sessions are going to be a 30 minute synchronous uh, session uh, weekly and we're going to really focus on just the question and answer, the discussions and there's going to be a tutor and a GTA present. Our GTAs are so important to our provision at Glasgow, we couldn't do it without them. They give the students something that we can't and we really, really want them there. So that kind of is, is such an important part of it for us. Um, again, we're going to use teams to try and facilitate the group work and there's going to be additional drop in sessions that have a lot of flexibility about timing uh, where they can go and see the GTAs and also uh, the peer assisted learning. The rationale for this. Uh, so uh, Smita is saying any thoughts, ideas on how you're going to train and support GTAs for their role. So the GTA training at Glasgow is uh, it's fairly extensive uh, as it is, but um, I, as course lead for level one psychology, I mean, we're designing all of this with the GTAs. They have a voice in this and it's really important that they have a voice in this because they, they bring that perspective. I um, Once we kind of fit, finalize the plan, I, there will be training sessions as regularly as they need them or want them and I can give them throughout the summer until everyone uh, is okay with that. Um, the rationale for the draft contingency hypothetical plan um, is that we need to increase the proportion of asynchronous activities without adding to students' workloads, without adding to staff workloads. Um, and we're hoping that the, the pre-recorded videos will be from the entire team. So they'll get to know multiple members uh, of staff from those videos. Um, I'm just going to skip that because we don't have time. Anyway, uh, in terms of the assessment, um, we'll use recorded assessment information videos and stuff like that. The exam, we're, there's still going to be a final uh, exam, but it's going to be a 24 hour open book exam rather than sitting in the lecture hall. Um, coursework, they used to do a group presentation, they'll get a choice. They can do you know, a video or an infographic or a TikTok or something like that. It's still very much TBC, talk to the team, we'll figure something out. Um, the multiple choice questions that we normally give them are going to include POYs. So if you don't know what POYs is, it's a system whereby students can make their own multiple choice questions and they can answer the ones each other have given. So it helps that engagement uh, and also their active learning. But basically, we don't really need any other changes. One of the great things about the programme that we have is that actually a lot of it was already blended. There was a lot of continuous assessment. And what it means is that rather than putting the staff workload onto trying to rip up all the assessments and start again, we can put it into just engaging with the students and trying to be there constantly uh, talking uh, to them. Uh, finally, I think finally, in terms of communication and support, so um, I am going to offer every psychology major an individual meeting with me upon arrival. I'm talking five or 10 minutes over Zoom just to check in. I know how much time that is, uh, and I think it's worth it. Um, normally they would get uh, a Friday email that tells them, summarizes you know, what happened that week and what they have to do next week. That will still continue, but this, um, this year it's going to also come with a video message. And that video message will include other members of staff, GTAs, and so on, so that they try and get the sense of the school and the community. Um, I'm planning on doing daily updates via Teams. Today you should be doing this. Today you should be doing this. Um, and if, I mean, is it spoon feeding? Yes, I still think it's helpful. Um, and that's very much a first year student thing. I wouldn't necessarily say that that needs to happen for second, third, fourth year, whatever. Um, and then finally, a really heavy focus on community. I'm, I'm quite lucky to work in a school where 
the community kind of aspect of it is, is already really strong. Um, but you know, there's things we, we did this year that we'll continue to do uh, a best team name, a best Zoom background competition, um, do a pub quiz online. Um, we're going to make sure that we're talking to the Psychology Society and PAL and that it's all linked up and things like actual Netflix parties, not just our fake lecture ones for, you know, watching psychology related movies and stuff like that. Um, so we're really trying to think about it from, uh, from all uh, aspects. Okay, so whew, this is stops to It's really hot in Glasgow. Um, that is my draft contingency plan. Uh, and as I said, it may change. Um, the team is still working on it uh, every day. So um, I think what's probably best now is I can stop sharing the screen and then we can maybe uh, just start answering some of the questions. I have been, Julie's saying, she's never heard it being hot in Glasgow. I have been sweating since I got here in November, 2018. The humidity is not what it was in Aberdeen. Um, yeah, so it's probably just easier. I think if we put on uh, cameras and um, then we can chat in the text box and just everyone can, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right, where's the... If it's okay, there's like a sort of a recurring theme, which I've seen in a lot of these discussions that I'd kind of like to address and kind of maybe get other people's feedback on as well. And this is, there's, I often find a lot of conversation about what tool will allow me to do this? Can I link this with this? And there's an awful lot of discussion about specific softwares and platforms. Personally, I come at this with quite an agnostic approach. There mm. are multiple ways of accessing materials, of, of having virtual conferences, We've in this discussion mentioned Zoom, Collaborate, Canvas. Um, uh, there was another one as well that I can't remember. Um, and I think everything has drawbacks and benefits. And I think it's maybe not hugely helpful, particularly because we do see um, some colleagues talking about a real fear and concern of IT um, systems being difficult to use and, and not feeling confident with different systems and sometimes I wonder if maybe those of us that are more au fait with different technologies if we're maybe putting up an extra barrier by going oh and you could use this and you could use this and have you ever tried such and such when actually maybe those of us in that bit more of a leadership position should be going these are the ones available in our university these this is what our digital education unit if we have one supports our learning technologists support and to try and kind of move that away a little bit from oh you can do this only in this particular platform and a little bit more towards um using the tools that you've got i think this kind of coming back to that really pragmatic discussion of how can we support you um it's just something i, I sometimes think uh, as, as we have these discussions just thinking that uh, so we've got louise and uh chiara there i can see you are there any words of wisdom you would like to contribute so that it's not just always me and Jill talking? We will talk. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll talk as well. So, um, so um, just to add on to what Jill said, I think for me what, so I'm, I'm currently Director of Learning and Teaching in my department. Um, and so we're planning for next year. Though I stepped down at the end of August, so I feel a little sorry for the person that's coming in. It's a great first year to be the the brand new director of learning and teaching, but we're having a transition phase. Um, and one of the things we've discussed is about consistency in terms of the approaches for students and staff. So we have staff in my department who are not clued up massively in terms of the technology. And so we've made a decision that for their, to help them achieve what they need to without it massively increasing their workload. And also for a consistent uh, experience for the students, we're standardizing what we want to happen in the different modules. So we've got the Echo 360 lecture capture platform um, and we've got Kaltura as well. Um, and we've made a decision that because the Echo 360 is where the students normally get their lectures captures from, that that's where we're going to put everything. So even if staff use Kaltura to record, they're just gonna have to upload it to the, the Echo 360. And I think consistency of experience for the students is really important because we don't want too many different technologies being used because they'll not know in individual modules whether they're coming or going because they won't know what technology the platform they need to go to. So 
I think we, we need to kind of keep it open that the technologies that we're using, but I just think we also need to be mindful that we need to keep a consistent experience for students. I would say my um, contribution is, um, aside from being a program director for online learning, is um, a lot of my other work is in neurodiversity and accessible education. And anything that we might be able to support on campus uh, for students that have individual needs uh, or challenges could potentially be compounded by having this pivot. So there is that necessity to consider not just pastoral care, but other things that might make the online educational environment, aside from practically more challenging, cognitively uh, and emotionally more challenging as well. Karen Goodall's got, sorry, Karen Goodall's got a really good question there, but I like the idea of not rewriting my lectures, but most of our captured lectures are not great quality and we need to provide subtitles or a transcript. So essentially most will have to record from scratch. Any advice on how to record a two hour lecture in a time efficient way? Um, so kind of like Chiara, I have some experience in um, as a, a program coordinator for our online MSCs at Edinburgh. and. One of the things I would always recommend to our guest lecturers as they were coming in is don't spend a lot of time um, sort of stopping your recording, going back, fixing that slide, starting again. Just record it as if it was a, a slide. If it makes you feel more co comfortable, stand up. If you've got like a long um, sort of mic uh, wire like I do, I sometimes just stand up and do my lecture as if I was um, in the room. I like to move my hands around a lot and uh, essentially when you stumble, when you have these uh, little uh, pauses, uh, mm, er, that's okay. That's a normal part of human patterns of speech and it actually helps people cognitively process what you're saying. Um, those uh, speech patterns are there for a reason. So I think there's how to record it in a time efficient way don't try and have this perfect, beautiful product. That is not what a lecture is. Um, instead, have an authentic product to you. So that's something that I would say. I don't know if anyone else has got any thoughts on that because I think that's a really, I think that's a really, really good question, Ros. I think that's a really good, uh, Karen, I think it's a really good practical question. Can I just come in and ask there? Um, so, um, I mean, similar to you, we're doing MSc teaching. So some of the lectures are quite long. And we've been told not to think of it as just chunking what you've already got there, but to kind of repackage it in a way that makes more sense, which does seem to go against the theory of not using lots of time to do it. So would you suggest chunking into 50 minute segments or missing bits out or, you know, what would be a time efficient way of doing that, but also still make sense? So I can tell you what I'm doing. I'm chunking my lectures. Now I am I'm doing that because I have the time to do it because I, uh, I'm going to record them anyway. I'm quite comfortable with the process and I can see some nice natural breakpoints. So I'm chunking my lectures. But I keep coming back to this uh, pragmatic leadership. Do you know, I was on that um, Advanced HE Aurora course a couple of years ago, and some of the things have actually stuck about trying to sort of have nice, authentic leadership in higher education. I think it's about recognizing the limitations that you have in your program, in your course. The things, what do you have control over? And we very rarely have control over our colleagues. Certainly we don't have control over their levels of expertise or their levels of comfort with something. What do you have control over and what can you influence in your position? And it will, I think, always be a compromise. It's, it's not going to be this, and I think that comes back to the rule one, you know, this is not a brand new online program and nor is it an on-campus program. It is something different and new and a compromise. So I do think there's actually a, a good answer to that, Karen. I think there is just what works for you in your specific situation and I think where at all possible, those of us with some management responsibility really need to try and um, support everybody to do the best they can in that situation. And something, a high horse, which I have, is I think we need to be really, really careful about um, student 
feedback on courses in this period, things like uh, National Student Survey and things like that, because I think this is such an unusual and difficult time that I am not confident in if that data can ever be integrated into the sort of historical data set and I want to be really really careful about the way that, we, that in my program certainly that I allow feedback to go to the lecturers because I want to ensure that somebody hasn't worked really hard maybe hasn't got it completely right and then gets that really horrible student feedback I think that's that's one of my concerns actually because staff are vulnerable here too Right. That's that's a big rant of mine. I will stop. I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> um, Helena had her hand up for a while and was sitting waiting patiently. So, <laughs> no, it was it was actually just to agree with Jill about what she's saying. Um, utilizing the talents and the things that you already have in students. The reason I'm speaking is because um, I'm the technology enhanced learning and teaching lead in the School of Psychology, and we're looking at changing a lot of this stuff. So I'm working with Emily and Carolina um, on their Moodle pages, for instance, and then we'll be working on Teams and other things like that. But I think one of the things that I've noticed with our school that I'm pretty sure is going on everywhere else is that there's a huge movement of people getting a lot of stuff in hand and starting to make resources available and starting to do training and all kinds of things like that. So one of the things that I'm doing is I'm sort of like just waiting for all that to shake you know, to, to shake into place a little bit before I'm going to go into that and select, pre-select just the key things for all the staff here. Because as you said, Joe and um, Karen as well, you don't need everything. You know, there's going to be, it's, it's, it's sort of a unique thing as well, working with people to understand what they need, what they particularly need. But the thing about consistency is so important. Um, we're facing... We've got five levels that are going to be working online. We have staff that will be working across various different levels. So if we have a staff member working at level one and they have one kind of thing happening and then they're working at level three and there's something else happening. I think those are the other things that are really important to um, keep in mind that you have people working across different levels and you can't have them all be completely different from each other. There has to be some kind of thing where you're just going to help people manage their workload a little bit in this time. But I think there's like just is pulling together a lot of really useful resources in digital accessibility that's going to come online and that's going to be available. And so people like myself, and I'm sure that all of us have them in our schools, um, we'll be looking at those things. And I think that's really useful to kind of keep in mind that there are people who actually have been paying attention to this stuff and just hear what they have to say as well. And you just need to go look for those people because they're everywhere. It's not, it's not a secret to them. And then, you know, um, what you were saying there about um, turning your long lectures that were in Echo 360 before into shorter things. One of the things that Echo 360 does, but also quite a lot of other software, is that you can actually play it and get a transcript from that. So if you find yourself in a situation where you need to re-record stuff, you can actually take an old lecture, get a transcript from that, and read it back in a new format and that saves a huge amount of time because you don't have to do that work again sometimes the transcripts that we have before will be full of those arms and r's and those other horrible things but actually what you can do is you can edit it a little bit and i think it's going to be a little bit more work this time actually probably substantially more work but in reality it's maybe going to take you four hours to do a lecture rather than two hours which you were spending before and i think it's i think it's all achievable we just have to keep focusing on that instead of it's a huge job because it's little chunks that you do. That's me. <laughs> Thanks, Elena. Um, there, there was just a, there was a question from Maxine there about using um, the one, a shared OneNote. Um, and I have to say that I've got this um, from uh, Stephen Watson, who is, I, I, I think he's here somewhere. Um, it, was, it was something I, I stole uh, from, from him. Uh, it's, it's a great idea. And I, I'm still kind of working with um, setting it up. Um, so it is it's very, very rough. Um, but I'll show you, um, like, and this is so rough. Okay. Uh, but so for, um, for, for level one, they'll have um, a different, um, I've just discovered that my colleague <laughs> has been into the shared notebook since I last looked at this. So thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, so for, for each of the three lecture streams, there'll be, you know, a, a different page for, for each of the lectures where they can add, you know, relevant readings and stuff. Um, and then also for each of the lab groups, 
um, they'll have um, their like a, a a notebook as well. I am still working on this. That like and you know and, and to be honest, I, I showed this to the team uh, last week just before all the exam boards, so they haven't actually had a chance to um, really feed back on it. So definitely a work in progress. But this is kind of what I was thinking was having a page for each of the lectures and then one for the lab groups and and stuff because it integrates into Microsoft Teams. It's definitely a work in progress. We don't really need digital linking for what we do, but but other subjects, uh, you know, it might be really for like maths particularly, uh, it's really useful. But that is my very bare bones idea that I'm sure the team will rip apart <laughs> when they've actually got time. Um, so I'll just stop sharing the screen uh, there. Okay. We have a question from Dustin. Um, there's his hand raised. Yes. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. It's not really a question. It's more of a uh, advice. Um, I hear a lot of concerns around the technology. Um, just for context, I'm a learning, a digital education facilitator, a glorified learning technologist, right? Pedagogue. So what I would say is don't worry too much about the technology. There should be more of a focus on the, the pedagogy, right? Your learning outcomes are key. The technology isn't key. So use what you have access to, but also use other things that may suit what, you, what your learning outcomes are. Um, I've shared a couple of links, and one of the best ones I could possibly you know, recommend is the hybrid pedagogy one, because their focus is solely on the pedagogy, and it's all research-based, research-evidenced, um, so I highly recommend looking at those articles. Uh, another book is this one. As you can see, I clearly have an agenda. I've co I come from pedagogy, critical digital pedagogy. So if you're into the critical pedagogies, you'll like these two resources. Um, but those are really good. They break it down. They make you feel relaxed, especially the book I've just shared, um, because they make you realize this is actually not too difficult right? We've moved beyond the emergency remote teaching and now it's June and we're getting ready for the autumn. So especially again, an urgency of teachers. Uh, if you look through some of the chapters, it's an easy read and it'll help you feel a bit more relaxed in approaching what you're doing as well. So. I think Marty wants to say something. Yes, if I may, um, just following on Dustin, um, I wrote a long comment in there, but um, probably full of typos and misunderstandings. But one thing that I'd really want to, well, one thing that resonates uh, from what Dustin said, you know, technology has that alienating dimension. We all have smartphones. Yes, it does connect, but it also really distance people. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I'm not a learning technologist. Um, I'm a researcher and I'm an educator. And what I would love to have included in your rule, set of rule is do not reinvent the wheel. You know, so long as we can create meaningful contact, it will empower us to convey, you know, the right content, the right pedagogical content will. And I think the emphasis should be really about meaningful content. Sure, if technology facilitates that, sure. But my hunch and my experience has been a bit more skeptical like Dustin's. I mean, yeah, let's not forget the ABC before we kind of develop new languages. And another slight small piece of feedback. Look, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, and I know it's, you know, it's putting yourselves out there and there's, of course, it'll invite lots of different feedback. But one thing that I missed along those 10 rules, and I think it really, really probably deserves to, to, to add an 11th one, um, and that is to do with the focus of those 10 rules. I missed a bit of a systemic perspective there. Um, I couldn't immediately see that any of those rules directly speak to our managers especially university, and I'm not talking just school managers, but university, you know, SMTs, senates, and, and you know, pro vice chancellors and the VCs, because they need to be, become part of this conversation. And so far what I have, and I'm sorry to sound frustrated, but I, I feel also equally passionate because in two, less than two, three months time, uh, you know, we're left on the ground to do what we normally do. 
and to do it well. But what I hear is very little concrete in their policies and tons of documents that they keep sending. And in addition to that, it's, I don't know where that philosophy comes from, but it is about right now we're preparing for a crisis situation. So whatever contingencies we're creating, you know, at the fore, it's about the contingency, it's about the crisis, right? And I find that really perverse to, in the midst of this crisis, to also tell us very explicitly, hey guys, this is not just for the crisis. This is what will become the new new, and they will become the permanent routines. And I would love you guys, given the voice you have, given the perspectives you have, given the experience you have, and this book paper will be out hopefully soon, please address those concerns too. So I think um, there's going to be a little bit of this where we're going to have to agree to disagree, I think. <laughs> um, so we got a lot of feedback on the paper. We got a huge amount. We got, we got loads and loads of emails. And I think what was interesting was that we actually got quite a lot of emails from people in senior management from various institutions. And I, I think one of the problems is that the paper certainly is being read and the emails that we were getting were suggesting that it was speaking to those, to, to management. And I, I think there is a problem with communication, particularly in terms of concreteness. You know, I'm, I'm currently sitting here with kind of my draft contingency plans. I don't know whether or not I'm going to use. Um, for us, we really wanted to write the paper to, be read by people who don't read pedagogy and i mean this with the best will in the world but if you send people a link that says hybrid critical digital pedagogy there are a class of lecturer who will just not click on it yeah absolutely uh, yeah yeah sorry <laughs> i'm interrupting you, Emily, on you go. i will continue my rant for like 30 seconds more and then you can take over um the feedback that we got again was um largely that the paper was written in a way that actually it was helpful. I, I know that we've got people on this chat that I've worked with in, in many different, you know, who would not normally be in a pedagogy uh, seminar. And I think it's that like, bring people in, in a language that doesn't turn them off and then we'll turn them, okay? <laughs> Give it two years. And I think there's loads gonna stick, but I'm just really conscious that the language we use has to take everyone with us and that is specifically and it wasn't an omission it was a choice for the paper i'm gonna let jill take over now sorry emily i think there's there's two great two, four two great points uh, in massey and and in dustin's um sort of discussions there there's that leadership and i would love Actually, I wouldn't. I would hate to be the leader of this university. But if I was anywhere like the leader of this university, I would still see a lot of challenges with, for example, um, there's quite a lot of lecturers out there who come in for one lecture. You know, it's a really important lecture that they do, but it's one lecture. They are the rest of the time a clinician or some amazingly fancy researcher or some practitioner, and their contribution to the material is brilliant, but they are not actually primarily educators. I think this is also extremely important in my experience in further education, where sometimes you also bring in um, practitioners, employers, things like that into that learning environment. We can't just get rid of that. So we need to be providing guidance that works for those folk as well. The second part that I thought was, uh, really important was yeah that discussion of like how do we get people to start thinking about the basics and the fundamentals so I um, I work a lot in our staff development program at the vet school and I work a lot on program design and assessment so how do you design a new program of teaching so uh, I have I think at last count I've been I've been involved in 20 program design um, exercises and in my experience of that, the biggest issue I've had has actually been getting academics to change their mind about something. You know, they'll, they'll write one set of learning outcomes and then they never want to change that, that set ever again. So there's a real subtlety in, in changing those behaviours, which um, I, 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 re I genuinely don't know if our approach is going to work 
but we kind of thought, let's try it this way, see if it works. And if it's any consolation, Massey, I do know, uh, maybe I'm not really supposed to say this, but I, I'm going to say it anyway. I know, that, uh, I know that the paper was discussed at University of Scotland LTC by the principals there. So um, it has been discussed at a high level, at least in this country. I don't know if that's use, I don't know if that's reassuring. Anyway, that's my kind of version of the rant. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think we have one more um, raised hand from Stephen. Um, yep, thank you. So that was very interesting. Thanks for all of that. I just wanted to uh, feed in a couple of things. So Emily, thank you for taking the time last week to interact with me on Teams. That was really kind of a fun thing to do to reach out to psychology because I had the pleasure as a mathematician accidentally of using Teams starting in January of this year. So I had adopted it because I was digitally inking and saw a platform that would allow me to integrate that into my teaching. And then of course, by accident, it became a vehicle to cope with uh, COVID. So I transitioned quite readily into delivering online without a glitch. However, there were many obstacles that I then came up against. <laughs> One of them being bandwidth, thanks Jill for mentioning that. Delivering lectures from your kitchen table is a problem when you're uh, you know, having several computers on. But one of the things that occurred for me was the joy of discovering that it was a more personable experience lecturing to my students face-to-face -face digitally than walking into a large lecture hall with 200 students at a distance. So the, the things I wanted to touch on here relate to the student experience. And, and the student sort of uh, message that I've received from that. So the cohort that I work with, and I work with them after COVID, after the teaching was over, because they were excited about this platform, so we did some development, was their desire for synchronous lectures. And so I, this is sort of the one thing I wanted to sort of explore, because of course, alternatively, you can chunk, have uh, in place, and have these uh, watching parties, which I think is a great idea, it's a very interesting idea, but their desire, for synchronous lectures where there is an actual dialogue in real time so that what I present is affected by their presence. Now, of course, they may not be present. Uh, but there's another counterpoint to this, and this comes back to accessibility. Most students do not have access to digital inking. And so this is the, the, the dilemma that I have, the accessibility part. And this perhaps doesn't relate to lectures, this relates to tutorials or labs. So I just throw that out there and sort of invite some feedback, perhaps, perspectives on that. I feel like I'm dominating this, but I, Stephen, I, I'm so glad you mentioned this, that the student feedback is that they prefer the synchronous lectures because I'm seeing the same feedback. I know a lot of other people are seeing that feedback mm -hmm. and it goes against a lot of what we've seen in the literature. And something that we have to consider is the literature on distance learners is on people who chose to be distance learners. Mm -hmm. And that is a different population to the learners we have right now. Mm -hmm. And I think we all need to be quite responsive as much as possible, um, thinking and going forward. So yeah, yes, and I will now shut up and let somebody else have some contribution. Are there any other questions, anything, any comment or anything before we close the session? If not, um, I will hand over, right, we'll ask if Emily has final comments um, and then we can close this, um, this webinar. Uh, no, just thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm gonna, I haven't managed to read everything in the chat, um, but I'm gonna go through the things because actually the last time we gave this talk, I had new ideas from, from listening to people. So it's just great to be able to come together. And I think the main thing is that we're going to get through this together and we're gonna have to share practice and ideas and also our anxieties because it sometimes just helps. Hear someone go, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thank you so much and thank you from the Tile Network. We have a recording of um, the session that we will put, uh, put online um, at some point together with a reflection report. So stay tuned and I see you hopefully next time. Bye. <laughs>